What would you think if you walked into a department store and you found absolute chaos? I mean, imagine this. Imagine the worst. As you walk down the aisles, you see the clothes there on the floor instead of on the hangers, right? And people have rifled through boxes of merchandise and left them laying all over the place. You ever seen that happen? Maybe around Christmas time, right? But as you walk through the place, the place is dimly lit. And you look up and you see a, a myriad of light bulbs that are burned out in the fixtures. And uh, you say, well, this is kind of a dumpy place, but you keep on going. And then you see that everything you're looking at, it, you start to realize none of the stuff has any price tags on it. And you're trying to figure out what stuff costs. But somehow, somehow you find something that you want to buy. You walk up to the checkout counter, but lo and behold... There's only one checker <laughs> in the whole store. And there's a, a line that's behind that checker, and it's huge. And you know it's not the poor checkout person's fault, but as you stand there looking at your watch, uh, what would be running through your head? What, what, what would you think? I mean, I know what I'd be thinking. I would be thinking, who is running this place? That's exactly what I would think. Clearly, these poor conditions are a reflection of poor management, a poorly run business, correct? Well, let me ask you, I want to get very personal with you right now, a personal question. When people step into your life, when they walk into your world, what do they find? What do you think their first impression is when they meet you and they engage in, 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 in conversation with you and, and they start to get to know you? Do they find a life that's in order or a life in disarray? You know, um, invariably, it forces us to ask a question. And the question for the Christian, and this is the important issue for those of us who are our believers, is who's in charge? Who's in charge? Today, I'd like to, to delve into that topic uh, a little because contrary to popular opinion, in the Christian life, we're not the ones who are supposed to be in charge. We're not the ones calling the shots. We have a new boss when we get saved. So I want to get into this passage in Ephesians chapter 5, and I want you to read it along with me if you have a Bible, Ephesians chapter 5, and we're going to pick it up in verse 17 here. But let me read it to you. It says here, So then, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. So as a child of God, all this stuff we've been talking about in this new series, uh, in this series we've been doing through Ephesians, um, do we know what God's will is for us? That's the question. When you start to read through this, it's, it's a foolish thing. Don't you think? It says um, to navigate through life without understanding what God wants for us. I mean, we think we know what's best for us, but what does God want? What would please God? That word there, foolish, means unwise or senseless. Are we foolish sometimes in navigating through the decisions of our life? Paul is saying here, it doesn't really make sense to try to live the Christian life without considering what God wants and what he thinks is important. His ways are better than our ways. So he's talking about the will for your life. And like it says in Romans, Paul says that later in chapter 12 of Romans, his will is good, acceptable, and perfect. So if this is true, then we, it would behoove us to know the will of God. Well, today I want you to see what I think is just about the most predominant thing that we should be focused on in our walk as believers. We want to see one thing that is God's will for every believer, and it's found in the next verse. Look what it says here in verse 18. It says, And do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. So here in this short little verse, we have two commands. The first one is something that we are told to avoid, and the second one is something we're told to embrace. And I want to focus more attention on the second today, but again, we see this contrast, don't we, between the life in the flesh and the life led by the Spirit. It's a contrast be between what the world has to offer and what God has already provided to you and I as believers. So he starts 
with this thing to avoid. The first thing he says is don't get drunk. Don't get drunk. Don't get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation. That word dissipation there, you know, other versions translate it differently. It means excess, existing hopelessly out of control. That's what that word dissipation means. It, that word specifically here, dissipation, it's only found in two other places in the New Testament. And in both of those places, it's translated riot. <laughs> and that's kind of what it is, drunkenness. Uh, it's out of control, right? Uh, he, he didn't in this passage forbid alcohol unilaterally. But when you're drunk, and that's the excess there, when you're drunk with alcohol, you do have a problem. You lose control. And many times you lose a lot more than that, right? You lose a whole lot more than just control. You lose maybe the respect of those around you as you make a fool of yourself, because that does happen from time to time. Some people have lost their jobs because of alcohol. Some people have lost their family because of their inability to limit the amount of alcohol that they consume. And uh, obviously, um, because it is so common, the addictive nature of alcohol, it would probably be wise to avoid it altogether. Uh, but he's talking specifically about what the world says. The world says that this is made for you to in, imbibe upon and freely uh, and liberally utilize in your life. It's important, and the more it, that you have, the better. Forget the consequences. So he's talking about don't be drunk with wine, but he's showing this contrast. But instead, Paul says there's something better. Here's what you really need, and that is be filled with the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. Here we have in this one verse, it's, it's an urgent, not a suggestion, it's a command that involves our cooperation. We are told to be filled with the Spirit. This is different than being indwelt by the Spirit. The moment that we place our faith and trust in Christ, the Bible says that we are indwelt with the Spirit of God, and He comes to live inside of us. Uh, so if you're saved, you have the Spirit, you have God's Spirit. But the question here is, are you filled by the Spirit? Are you walking in the Spirit? Are you abiding in the Spirit? That's a totally different uh, set of circumstances. The indwelling of the Spirit is a permanent, unchanging, one-time event. And not only are we indwelt, but the Bible even goes further. He resides to every single Christian, and they have been sealed, it says, by the Holy Spirit. You know what that means? That means that you're, you're locked in. If you look back at earlier in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, what is that verse that we read there earlier? He says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. God literally in this verse is saying, I'm setting a seal upon you as a believer. The Holy Spirit is our guarantee that we are his. You belong to God, and the Holy Spirit is hanging on to you. The moment that you put your faith in Christ, there no more needs to be anything other things that you have to do on top of that. The Spirit is our stamp. It's showing this um, unalterable state uh, and position and standing that you have because he seals us. We are then, and this is the implication that's so wonderful, we are eternally secure. That means that we can't lose our salvation. God has us the moment that we're saved. Isn't that a wonderful thought? But here, in this verse, we have something different. Yes, there's this permanent state of being indwelt by the Spirit where he resides in us and we're sealed by him, but we have something different here. Filling is not the same. Filling is something that we must do, and it's a command that has been given to us as believers. So filling is something that depends upon the cooperation of both God's Spirit and ours. To be filled with the Spirit, if you wanted to just make it in the vernacular, is basically saying, God, I'm putting you in charge of my life. And that's really something that we need to do continuously every single day. 
Because tomorrow you might not feel like having God in charge of your life. This needs to be something that is an intentional thing that we do. When you wake up in the morning, you have to decide who's going to be in control. Is it the Spirit of God or is it going to be my own flesh, my own selfish desires? It's not just um, in the morning either. It should be throughout the day because there's going to be opportunities where we're going to be tempted and we're going to have different situations and we're going to feel like going in a different direction. And we at that point need to say, who is controlling my life? Who's in charge here? Who's running this ship, right? And I think that when we get to the end of it all, it needs, our, our life needs to be a reflection of the Spirit of God helping us to make the right choices. And um, so anyways, this filling, it's a continuous thing. It's a repeated event. And God wants us not to just be filled to the top, but to overflowing with his Spirit. So the question is, who's controlling you? I mean, this is for you personally. Is the Spirit of God controlling your life or is your flesh? And, and that's just a decision that you have to make. When you are walking in the Spirit, you're spiritual. When you're walking in the flesh, you're carnal, you're fleshly. There's a passage in Galatians that is a, really like a, a twin to this passage in Ephesians. It, it just talks about it sort of in the inverse. But Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 it says, Paul saying, again, Paul writing to another group of Christians, he says, but I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. He's making it very clear. If you're walking in the Spirit, you won't be walking in the flesh. It's one or the other. It's kind of hard to walk in the flesh when you're walking in the Spirit. In fact, it's impossible. And then he goes on, he says in verse 17, for the flesh sets its desire against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh, for these are in opposition to one another. That's the reason. The flesh is going in a totally different direction than the spirit. The flesh wants to do one thing and the spirit is saying, no, do a different thing. And so there's this conflict that's there, right? It says, so that you may not do the things that you please. This is, this is something that you have this, this turmoil in, in this battle between the flesh and the spirit. Verse 18 goes on, though. If you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Are you asking yourself, is the spirit the one that's leading me in my choices and my decisions and in the actions that I, that I uh, now am engaged in? A few verses later, in uh, the same chapter, it says, if we live by the spirit, let us also Walk by the Spirit. You were saved because of the Spirit. He says, the Spirit saved you. You were saved in the same way. Walk by the Spirit. Just entrusting your life to the Spirit. So to be filled with the Spirit is to be walking in the Spirit, as this passage talks about. It's a question of control. And uh, I think that we diminish the value of this thing called filling. Because it's, it's a spiritual asset. It's a resource that has been given to us, the Spirit of God, to empower us for godly living. We really can't do it in our own abilities and humanness. To think that God's Spirit is accessible to us at a moment's notice. He's not only living inside of us, but he's working through us. It's a big difference. It's a big difference to have someone in the, in the wings and to actually call them out and say, okay, I'm enlisting your aid, Holy Spirit. And that's what filling is. Later, Paul, he gives a whole list in Galatians of what happens. When we are filled with the Spirit, you cannot produce the fruit of the Spirit unless you're filled with the Spirit. And he, and he talks about those, right? Remember that list? The fruit of the Spirit is what? Is love, love. Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. You just can't fit it all in one verse, right? Verse 23, gentleness, self-control. I mean, look at that list. What a, what a diametrically different life we have than one that is led by the flesh. And you can go, and, go back to chapter 5 and read the works of the flesh. And there's things that I don't think 
those would be the kind of character traits you would want to emulate. These, these traits that we just read, they are all manifestations of a life that has been empowered by a supernatural God. He is supernaturally enabling us to do and to live a different way, a transformed life. So I have to tell you, you know, this is a misnomer. The Christian life is, is really not a list of do's and don'ts. And we can't reduce spiritual maturity down to simply behavior modification. Like if I just don't do this and I do this and then I'm a mature Christian. That's not what God is doing it's about God changing us. It's not, we don't change our behavior and then we get closer to God. No, God changes us and, and that increases and develops the intimacy of our relationship with God. You cannot produce the fruit of the Spirit unless you're filled with the Spirit. And I, I just think it's really so important that we, I mean, all those things that we've been talking about in chapter 5, these admonitions in the first 17 verses that we looked at, those cannot be accomplished unless we are filled by the Spirit. And it's a reality. And we need to ask ourselves, are we allowing the Spirit of God to have his way? I mean, the Spirit is not going to force himself. That we do have this element of free will in the Christian life. God is encouraging, entreating, admonishing us, convicting us sometimes reproving us when we're not doing the right thing. But at the end of the day, we have to be willing to cooperate. And um, maybe we should start the day different. I wrote this down, this prayer. Perhaps we should get up every morning and say this. Good morning, Lord. <laughs> Do you ever say good morning, Lord? <laughs> I don't know. It's just... Think about it, though. You're laying in bed, and you say, hey, good morning, Lord. Before I do anything, before I step out of bed, I am inviting you to use me today in whatever way you choose. I'm at your disposal. I'm yours. Lord, I'm trusting you to steer this ship wherever you want to take it. Lord, I want you to fill me. Give me your strength. Give me your mind. Give me the mind of Christ. Take control, Lord, so that... When people look at me, they'll actually see you. Lord, I want to be filled by you. Empower me to do what I cannot do in my humanness. I want to be used by you, so fill me, Lord, with your spirit today. That would be a wonderful way to start the day. And that's really the mindset. That's the attitude of someone who wants to be spirit-filled is that they're constantly inviting God to be a part of the equation. And I suppose that really begs the question. The question is, is, are we even willing to have the Spirit of God fill us? Because what that will mean is that we're going to let God take us in the direction that he wants to go. And maybe you're set in your ways. You say, I really like my lifestyle. I like it. But to really get to that point where you finally realize the emptiness of your own foolish pursuits. I like that song that uh, uh, has been sung. It's an old hymn, the chorus. Fill my cup, Lord, I lift it up, Lord. Come and quench this thirsting of my soul. Bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Fill my cup, fill it up, make me whole. Just to think like you're coming. Imagine that picture. You're, you're coming with your empty cup and saying, fill me, God. I don't want anything else to fill my cup. I want you to fill my cup, God. Are we willing to say, God, fill my cup? There's nothing in this world that compares to what you have. I want you. Like that song, there's nothing in this world that compares to knowing God. That song we sang about Holy Spirit. Oh, my goodness. That we would invite the Holy Spirit to take up um, a special spot in our hearts. He's already there. Why not invite him to, to have deeper, richer fellowship? And say, not my will, Lord, but your will. I want to die to self. I want, I want you to be my all in all. So who's in charge? Who's calling the shots right now? I, I want to backtrack just a little bit. That first warning of drinking to excess. You know, you think about it, Why do people drink? Sometimes there's a variety of reasons. Sometimes they're chasing after their youth. Maybe they're trying to recapture some excitement. 
of the early years. They forgot how much trouble their drinking caused them in the early years, but anyway. Uh, but no one ever talks about the downside. They never talk about, you know, the things that happen. You know, they never talk about the hangover after, right? And um, I think this is really a good il illustration because when you, when you look at the consequences or the results, you see a, a totally different outcome, right? When you, we, we lead a life of reckless indiscretion, where we allow um, wine to control us, we lose our self-control. We lose a lot of things. But when, when we have the Spirit of God, everything changes. Everything changes. Drinking is a very poor replacement for what God has to offer. You know, we're looking for satisfaction when we drink and meaning in that bottle. And all it does is, is mask the emptiness that we really have. We're trying to fill something that only God can fill. The only place that we're going to find true happiness and purpose is, is by being filled with the Spirit. So the Spirit of God doesn't only empower us, but he fills us with a purpose and satisfaction that we cannot get anywhere else. And I know that this is so endemic in our culture. Alcohol is everywhere. And Satan has convinced so many people, so many souls, that their greatest source of satisfaction can be found at the tavern. And um, people are so convinced, and at, until you get to the end of it, until you're really, you know, scraping the bottom of the barrel, you don't ever want to come to that place of admitting it. Um, there's just something happens. But there's an alternative, right? There's an alternative, and that's that God can satisfy us. Um, why don't you look at these three little things here when you're filled. These are some of the benefits of being filled by the Spirit. And the, and the one that is right there on the top is the one that I want you to relish in. I mean, obviously, we're, we're, we're going to be empowered, but look at that first one. The Spirit satisfies our soul. When you're filled with the Spirit, when you're walking in the Spirit... I'm telling you, there's nothing that really beats having this intimate, abiding relationship with God on a daily basis. That is the difference between Christianity and many other religions. You have this relationship, and then God actually is walking with you, like walking with Adam and Eve in the garden. That's what he wants to do with you. And the Holy Spirit is, is not just there, but he wants to... He wants to, like, sup with you. He wants to, to just fill you up and give you a sense of satisfaction in your soul. And I think we miss out on that. I think we miss out on that altogether. And the second thing it says, the Spirit influences our choices. You know, when we are filled with the Spirit, when we're walking in the Spirit, when we're allowing the Spirit to control us, He gives us the mind of Christ. He helps us to have wisdom to see and make good choices. When you're walking in the flesh, well, then you're only depending on this limited, finite mind of yours, which is quite finite, I have to tell you. I mean, it's really limited. I mean, you don't have very much in that little... We're, we all got a pea brain compared to the Holy Spirit, right? We, we need the infinite resources of God's wisdom. And guess what happens when we walk in the Spirit? He helps to influence the choices that we make. And then, number three, it says the Spirit empowers us. When we're filled with the Spirit, we have this enablement, this supernatural enablement to overcome sin in our life, to be able to have victory in the Christian life, to be able to see um, things that we pray about be, come to fruition. I mean, God wants to do things through us, but if we're doing it in our own power, we're going to fail. And God says, I, I want you to walk in the Spirit. Just walk in the Spirit. So instead of, instead of drinking wine to quench, quench the thirst of your soul, why not drink the living water? Why not drink of the living water? You know, I was thinking about this, you know, kind of in closing. You know, Jesus kind of talked about this, didn't he? He echoed this sentiment. Remember when he was, he was talking, he says, and there was the big feast was going on. And then he got up and spoke. And he said in, in John chapter 7, verse 37, he says, Now on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. 
Verse 38, he who believes in me, as the scripture said, from, this, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. What's he talking about here? What do you mean? This is from the innermost being will flow rivers of living water. He, well, he, he answers it right in the next verse. He says, but this he spoke of the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For the Spirit has not yet given, because Jesus has not yet been glorified. So Jesus is basically saying, if you, if you believe, if you, if you, right there in the beginning, if you believe in me, you are going to receive the Spirit. Here they were standing on the last day of the feast, and Jesus is promising them something better. I got something better than all your feasts and your rituals, better than that wine which you were drinking. I'm for sure they consumed some wine at the feast, right? What he was offering them was something that was inexhaustible, an inexhaustible fountain that's going to spring from their innermost being. He was promising this overflow that was going to burst forth from the indwelling of the Spirit, which we know now was fulfilled at the day of Pentecost, right? On Pentecost, it says that they received the Holy Spirit, but that Holy Spirit just grabbed them, and guess what? It it filled them. Filled them to overflowing, and the church became a force. John 4.14 says, Whoever drinks of the water I will give him shall never thirst. When you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you are going to be satisfied. And I think God wants you to have that. He wants you to enjoy that. Learning this daily submission as we walk in in the steps of Jesus. Being filled by his spirit, for his honor and for his glory. And I, I just think that if, if we're filled with the spirit, if we're being controlled by the spirit, it'll all work out. It'll all work out. It's the truth. You, we got all these worries. You got all these cares. You got all these burdens you're carrying. If you're walking in the spirit, if you're filled by the spirit, if you're controlled by the spirit, if you're empowered by the spirit and led by the spirit, then you're not going to be led in a bad direction. God's going to take care of everything. God is a promise keeper when it comes to this greatest of all promises, the promise of the Holy Spirit. So I just encourage you to enjoy God's Spirit in your life. Don't resist Him because you're missing out. You're missing out. It's good and you won't ever thirst. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you for... um, this simple little injunction here that you've given us. You're calling us as your children to be filled by the Spirit. I pray, Lord, that we would, we would yield ourselves to you, that we would yield our own right of way to let you be in charge, that it, we really would be saying to you, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. And Lord, I pray, Lord, If there's anybody here who's never trusted you as their Savior, then maybe for the first time they would say, you know, I I can't stand before a holy God because I have no answers. I have nothing that I can offer. But I believe that Jesus paid the price. I believe that Jesus, in his death on the cross, took my place. And I trust him as my Savior now. If you've never done that, if you're listening to this, that's where it all starts. Because the moment that you put your faith in Christ, the Holy Spirit will come and live inside of you, and he'll never leave you. So we pray for this, Lord, in Christ's name. Amen.